عندي 106 سنين 106 سنين الحمد لله <تصفيق> Welcome to Meet Us on the Abraham Path. I'm Anissa Mehdi, Executive Director of the Abraham Path Initiative. We're glad you joined us. We are now in season three of API's webinar series. And we are focusing here on the peoples and cultures of the region known as the Middle East. We shine light on the timeless traditions of hospitality and the spectacular landscapes of this highly complex region. It's located in Southwest Asia geographically. And we know, as you do, that there's discord and there's conflict in this region. But we also want you to know what makes it so beautiful and appealing. Our vision for the future is that this region becomes better known as a place to walk and connect and converse. And that when you hear the term, the Middle East, what will come to mind will be warm and welcoming people. All right, that may be a ways off, but we're moving toward that step by step, driving economic growth and social development and cultural heritage preservation through the tool of community-based tourism. And of course, with online programming like this webinar. Today, we'll be looking at the future of tourism in the Middle East. The pandemic has been devastating for tour operators and guides, restaurateurs, hoteliers, homestay hosts. The impact has been enormous. Joining us are tourism experts from Iraq, Palestine, and Turkey. Later this year, we hope to bring experts from other countries with walking trails like Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia. All right, I'd like to introduce today's guests to you. From the city of Jerusalem, we welcome Dimitri Kashram, inbound manager at Aeolus Tours. Dimitri, welcome back to meet us on the Abraham Path. It's really great to have you again. Thank you, Anissa. And we also welcome from the Iraqi city of Choman in Iraq's north west, northeast, uh, we have Omar Chomani, who is the head of VI Kurdistan in the Kurdistan regional government area of Iraq. Welcome, Omar. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. We also welcome from Turkey, Kate Clow, chairperson of the Culture Roots Society. She is also author of The Lickian Way, Turkey's first long distance walking route. And I've got actually a map that gives you an idea of where our guests are from. The region we're talking about, we think of the Middle East as one place, but look at all these different countries. And we have Kate here from Turkey. So she's down in this part of Turkey, Antalya. We have Omer here from Northeastern Iraq up in the Kurdistan regional government area of Iraq. And we have Dimitri in the city of Jerusalem. So you get a sense of the expanse of this area. And when we think sometimes, and I want you guys to talk about this actually, sometimes people think of this region as a dangerous place and are afraid perhaps to go. What is your response when people wonder about the danger of this region? We opened down the first walking track in Turkey nearly 30 years ago now. And yes, of course, we ha have had some um, problems with um, you know, occasional, very small problems. But I always tell the people that inquire, and it's mainly Americans, by the way, the Europeans and um, other nationalities don't, just don't seem to bother. It's Americans that are wor worried about their safety rather than anyone else. Um, it's just not necessary. Um, you know, I've walked in this country on my own as a woman for 30 years without any hassle whatsoever. And um, I can honestly say I'd rather be walking in the mountains in Turkey and I feel safer walking in the mountains in Turkey than I do crossing the road in London. Well, there's a statement. I like that statement, Kate. I think it's an empowering statement. And one of the things that, that is important to do is to break, interrupt people's thinking 
about a region. Dimitri, can you continue that interruption or, or should people be afraid? I think we all have misconceptions about a lot of places in the world. Uh, we see that especially here in Palestine, where there's so much of everything in the news, but the major component of the human aspect is always missing. If you ever have a chance to walk in, around the villages or in the cities, even in Palestine, it's very safe, it's very easy. And the worst case that can happen is somebody invites you for coffee and tea and you don't know how to say no. And so it's something to keep in mind uh, going around. And uh, uh, to, to, when you travel, to try to keep an open mind because people are people everywhere and everybody wants to uh, do good. Everybody wants to make people happy. And we all just want to connect at the, at the end of it. That's true. And if our worst problem is learning how to say no to someone who wants to offer us coffee or tea, hey, that's not a bad problem. And learning to say no is often difficult anyway. So you, you should be learning how to do that. But Omer, I want you to say yes right now and tell us what are some of the preconceived notions people have about your part of the world, the Kurdistan uh, government region of Iraq? How, what do people think? What do you hear? And what is true? Is it a dangerous place to visit? Yes, we cannot hide some problems from Iraqi Kurdistan because you know we have still now some problems on the border uh, with uh, Turkey, like a PKK with Turkey and bombing sometime on the mountains. But it's like some area; it's not from all the places on, and we we cannot uh, we every everyone is now about we still have some problem with the ISIS from some places uh, from Iraq and but it's not from the part of Kurdistan because we have only have uh, three cities like Erbil, Duhok and Slimania. We still very safe and uh, uh, before ISIS couldn't control any place from the Kurdistan's part. But you know uh, many people still know because. Uh, the first time ISIS coming to Iraq, the people is afraid about Iraq. And they are true to afraid because there was very big uh, group and make a big problem for the world, especially for Iraq as well. So it's, we need uh, like a long time to explain for everyone in the world. From Elbil, for example, we have a bar and we have a disco. It's very safe and uh, we live with a different religious from Elbil. We have not any problems, but it is because it's Iraq, the part of Iraq, then that's why uh, many people still uh, are afraid about Iraq. But Erbil is the capital of uh, Kurdistan and more one million people living there with the Christian and Jew and many different religions there. So, um, and we have an international airport and everyone can, more 32 countries in the world, they can fly to Erbil very safely. And we have more uh, around, 50 uh, consul from Erbil. So that's all very safe. And during the ISIS coming to Iraq, there was have not any problem from Erbil and other cities from Kurdistan. And we've been seeing there the, the beautiful citadel. Of yeah, 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 yeah. We have very yeah. historical places from Erbil. How old is that citadel? It's more to uh, a thousand years ago. So it's, and it's up on a hill as citadels tend to be almost all over the world where people, either the, either the monks or the military have the best views, it seems. Yeah, from that yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's in the middle of the center of Erbil, the citadel. And uh, yeah, at starting lives was starting from in this citadel from Erbil. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, each of you <clears throat> welcomes guests, each of you helps people learn about your, your country, your geography, your adopted home, perhaps in Kate's uh, situation. Um, have, have you traveled to the places that any of your other panelists have been? Uh, have you been to Northeastern uh, Iraq? Have you been to Palestine, have you been to Turkey? And what are your thoughts about those places? What may have surprised you when you got there? I ask this because, I ask this because again, I think sometimes our viewers, probably not the viewers with us here and now because you are a self-selected group that 
already has a much broader point of view about the region. But a lot of people think of, of this as one place, the Middle East, and it's dangerous. But even within, there are different cultures. And we may be surprised ourselves by what we see in someone else's home country. What can you tell me that has impressed or surprised you? How about you, Dimitri? So, I mean, one thing to know about the Middle East to start with, um, every city and every village can, in a sense, have its own culture. Um, even in Palestine, like I live in Jerusalem, if I go south to Bethlehem, I can have certain, I mean, because it's Palestine, it can be minor culture shocks at times, but they can still count as minor uh, culture shocks. Uh, there are a lot of things that are different uh, going from the way you cook a, diff a specific dish or you speak in a different certain way. And so I completely agree with that premise. I myself have been to Antalya before uh, when I was a child. I mean, I'm 31 at this point, but when I was in my teen years, I've been to Antalya and uh, it was a very touristic uh, trip. And I was, I was actually uh, thinking about that and regretting that I wasn't able to have a more culturally immersive uh, experience. I went on a resort uh, kind of trip. And uh, when we went to visit the, the city and uh, to see the surroundings of the resort, it felt like there was a lot to be discovered. And we were kind of locked up in the resort all the time. So I completely agree with the premise that there's a lot to explore. The culture is very wide. Uh, and there's a lot of things to experience especially from different walks of life within specific countries. I mean, in Palestine itself, we have just from different cultural backgrounds, not from a non-geographical setting, from an ethnic setting. We have Palestinians, we have uh, Jews, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have a little bit of Circassians, we have Jews, uh, we have Samaritans. So you have uh, so many different kind of uh, aspects of humanity that you can explore and experience uh, that just live in their old cultural traditions. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention Armenians. Uh, my Armenian friends would be sad, so I have to, <laughs> have to mention them too. But there's so much to explore and everybody lives in their old cultural bubble. And sometimes it's just the best thing to do is to burst that bu bubble and kind of get acquainted with your neighbors uh, at that point. And it's very immersive. It teaches you a lot about the world and it gets you closer to everyone. Kate, Omer, would either of you like to make a comment here? Unfortunately, I haven't traveled in the Middle East as much as I'd like. I've been to Sinai and to Israel, but not to Palestine or to Jordan. Um, but the strange thing is that everyone comes to us, um, especially since the Syrian war. Um, of course, Turkey has taken in, what, three million refugees? Um, and prior to that, um, in the troubles in Kurdistan, a lot of Kurdish um, people moved from your area, from Erbil into Turkey, um, and made their homes there. So I know many, many Kurds. I know many, many Syrians, many Armenians, um, e Egyptians and Jordanians and so on. But they've all come to me rather than me going to them. And at one time during the, um, the worst of the troubles in, in Syria, um, we had a house full of Syrian refugees here because they had nowhere else to go. And we were sort of a kickoff point in, uh, in Antalya. It's a useful stop off point for people on their way, hopefully to Europe or to um, the further west. Um, but some of them stayed, of course, and some of them are, are still our very good friends. And the best thing about places further east from us is the cooking. And <laughs> I just love Syrian food um, and Palestinian food and Jordanian food. <laughs> and even the food in the east of Turkey is better than the food in the west. Um, it's just wonderful. Yes. And... Um, I've, it's always a pleasure to hand my kitchen over to somebody else who's going to cook for me. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should just um, let's get to talking about this this subject more directly. The um, you know in in Palestine, tourism is a primary generator of revenue. Uh, in the Kurdistan regional government, there's a hope that tourism will become uh, a part of a diversified economy, 
So not so much reliance on fossil fuels, but really grow the, the sectors of tourism and agriculture because there are great uh, fertile lands in your, your home area, uh, Omer. And in Turkey, uh, a couple of years ago, Kate, I remember you and I were talking about this, an announcement that the government was, was going to begin promoting religious tourism. You know, also looking to open up uh, for tourists. So let's start with the question that's, you know, that's begging being asked, how has the coronavirus not only changed the game, but how has it made you, each of you, a more creative player in that game? And I know each of you has a few photos to share. I'm gonna start with you, Dimitri, if you wanna use your uh, photos at this time, that would be fine. We want to know how it's not only challenged, but made you creative. Sure. Uh, let me share my screen first. There we go. First of all, this is a picture of uh, a good craftsman in Bethlehem. Uh, knowing Palestine, we're a very re religious destination for a lot of people and have been for over a millennia. We as island tours have done a lot to diversify out of that field specifically not because of it uh, being difficult or anything, but because there's such just so much more to explore than the religious aspect of it. And so what you see in the picture is the woodcraft craftsman is crafting angels and religious figures out of olive wood, which is uh, very much a commodity um, in Palestine. Uh, we use uh, olives and olive wood for so many things. We have a lot of olive oil, olive wood for crafting, a lot of things. Um, and the, the olive tree itself is a very kind of sacred, uh, tree uh, um, in the region. It was brought in by the Romans when they were here initially. But I will go ahead and start with um, the question. So there are five different aspects to what you asked. Um, we can say it's bookings, operations, financials, competition, and creativity. So all these five sectors have been somewhat hit by coronavirus, and they're all aspects that will affect tourism coming to the region going forward. Uh, from one point, we since the opening of the borders and the airport, we've had a big surge of bookings. Now, this is a problem in one regard and a blessing in another. So everything kind of is a double-edged sword at this point. It is a blessing because we have finally have uh, business coming back in, the industry starting to get revitalized, being able to share our expertise again, we're being able to interact with internationals again and to, to have them experience the tourism on the ground that we wish to offer everybody. But from another standpoint, we have a lack in capacity. So in a lot of areas, we don't have the workforce that we had pre-COVID. We don't have the facilities at the level that we had pre-COVID. And that seems to be an issue because for a lot of people, they're unable to work at full capacity. This is Artos and Batir. There are villages, oh, Batir is a village and Artos is a region around Bethlehem. They're both known for, for either agriculture and Batir is known for its uh, agricultural terraces. And they are a UNESCO heritage site. The folks at Batir have fought very hard to get the UNESCO to recognize them. So uh, it's very much worth the visit if you ever get the chance to come. And they're very well known for their eggplant. Remember that to try the eggplant from Batir. To go on with my explanations, in terms of operations, there's, uh, we have gotten to a point where we have uh, enough people in the industry who are experienced enough in tourism to manage things well, but we still have, lack a lot of the ability to hire those people back. And so that seems to affect a lot of operations in the sector. That's a double-edged sword because, again, we have bookings coming in and we have people who are qualified working in the sector. And so whatever the region and the industry are doing, we're being able to do right. But at the same time, we cannot increase a lot of our uh, bookings going forward. Hebron, um, I like to call it the Florida of Palestine for many reasons, <laughs> but it is very well known and not because I call it the Florida of Palestine. It's very well known for its uh, manufacturing. Traditionally, it's very well known to making ceramics and glass. If you ever go to Hebron, the first thing people will say, you have to visit those workshops. This is a very important thing, and it's a, it's a thing that the people of Hebron take a lot of pride in. And it's also known for the tomb of the patriarchs, which is a very important religious site for both Muslims and Jews. 
uh, and it's uh, very much a contested site, but at the same time, it's worth a visit. So uh, forward, Jenin is also, I think, a very important and uh, sidelined destination. Uh, it's known for its agriculture, and a lot of people don't go there because there's a lack of sites, and I mean, relatively to other Palestinian cities and villages. Uh, but it's one of the nicest places to visit. The people are very nice, and it's very agriculturally rich. It is part of the agricultural sector in the West Bank, and uh, it's known for that level. We have been developing uh, a few tours we're trying to work on to get people to not only be able to go to Janine and experience the agriculture, but also to uh, be able to get recipes and cook based on Palestinian recipes from that area when they go home. And so that's something that we have in the works uh, that would be interesting to do. On the picture on the right, you can see the carob juice. This is something that's very famous around the Middle East. Uh, you can find it in Egypt and Lebanon and Jordan. I don't know if you can find it in Turkey or um, Kurdistan, but uh, it's very famous uh, in Palestine specifically and the Levant area. It's known to have very good uh, effects in terms of uh, the immunity. It's very good to boost your immunity and you will find a lot of people walking around different cities in Palestine working, wearing a, a specific uniform for the carob juice, uh, the person who serves the carob juice, and you can buy it for a small amount uh, in a plastic cup anywhere. And if you can see the uh, uh, what, what they're using uh, to pour the carob juice into a, a cup. And so this is a, a very significant thing that uh, we as locals kind of forego and ignore sometimes because we see it so much, but can be very interesting for somebody from coming up, coming from abroad. Uh, Mount Gerizim is a very interesting aspect for us Palestinians. It is right next to Nablus, and it is the home of the, the Samaritans. The Samaritans, are, by a lot of people, are considered to be as kind of a, one of the tribes of the Jews. They, they say that they hold the uh, oldest version of the Torah with them. And they are a very interesting group of people. Uh, this specific uh, ethnicity is given protection both by the Palestinians and the Israelis, and they carry, and the Jordanians actually, and they carry three different passports. So it's a very interesting uh, form of life that they have. It's a very much enclosed and exclusive society on a lot of levels, uh, but it's a very interesting society to visit and interact with them and see how they live. Uh, and so it, for, for Palestinians, this is a very special area and people to interact with. Uh, Ramallah, of course, is the economic and the financial uh, capital of Palestine uh, for the time being, uh, for all intents and purposes. Uh, it is the place to go if people want to uh, do more business. It is the place to go if people want to be close to the most of the government offices. And it is the place to go if you want to have more of a nightlife. So the, most of the, rest, the advanced restaurants you can say in Palestine are in Ramallah. Uh, I know some people would disagree and say it's Bethlehem, but that's kind of going rivalry right now. Um, all the, uh, anybody who wants to have a bit of nightlife, also Ramallah is very rich in that aspect. And it's kind of the more secular cities uh, in the region, you can say, or the most one uh, in, in Palestine. Uh, this country in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem has its own Kind of fluctuations. Jifna is another agricultural area around Ramallah. And it's, people like to go there to get out of the hustle and bustle of the city and have a nice meal. So that's one thing that we all like to do. And finally, the old city of Jerusalem, where, uh, I mean, my family has been in Jerusalem for a long time, and I won't bore you with the details, but the old city of Jerusalem is a very interesting place to visit. Um, the walls have been built by the Turks, uh, and that's a connection to Turkey. Uh, during the Ottoman rule, uh, and it has uh, thousands of years of history in there, and there's a lot to do in the city. We have uh, restaurants, we have uh, different peoples, we have different cultures, different religions, all interacting all at the same time, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting thing to go and just watch. I know some uh, visitors that we had who like to go to the whole city and just sit at a cafe and just watch people go and interact, because it, it goes by through different languages and different aspects, and it's just very interesting seeing people inter interact together and try to speak their own languages to each other, which can, sometimes can be really funny. So <laughs> keep that in mind if you ever visit the city. Uh, and it takes me back to the, the three last issues regarding restarting tourism in the region. 
I will speak about the last two first, which is competition and creativity. And this is a very important aspect uh, for us at Arelos Tours. We've always been trying to push the boundaries of what we can do with tourism and to avoid the, uh, you can say, usual uh, mainstream tourism. We have a word for it at the office. We call it cattle tourism, where you just bus people around to see a bunch of places and take pictures. So this is something we try to avoid, avoid mostly. And uh, we, we like to venture into new things and try to, diff to experience things differently. And going back to that, we like to feel that a tour has to attack your senses. It's not just about going places and seeing things. It's about uh, interacting with people. It's about tasting the food. It's about, yes, watching things that are incredible. It's about also the, it has to attack all the senses. And this is something that's extremely important for us because we want people when they go back home to remember the, the trip. And we don't want people to just you know, say, we've been to all these places, we took a bunch of pictures and we don't remember anything. And so this is kind of the third degree of things that we want people to remember because the first two are first how people made you feel and the second is the food. So <laughs> the third dimension is if you went home and you remember the trip and you had a lot of fun, then we covered all three and um, that works well. Uh, so for the creativity aspect, it's extremely important. A lot of tour operators, especially now, have very high difficulty in creativity and in competition. A lot of the services that are being offered are going to be focused on competition based on price and not based on value. And uh, that's something to look out for because that means that the cost per value is going to be not what you're looking for. Um, well, that growing competition you mentioned, Dimitri, between Ramallah and Bethlehem, that's exciting. And that is very exciting. We just have to hope that enough people come to actually let them enjoy that rivalry rather yes. than you know wallow without having evidence of how <laughs> it's going. Definitely, definitely that. Thank but you so really much. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for that. Let's uh, let's turn to Kate Clow and get uh, a, a, an image of what's happening in Turkey. That the questions of challenge and creativity. Eager to hear. Right, I'm going to try sharing my screen. Just right. Just, right th this is Turkey, and Turkey until um, 2019 was building its tourism up very nicely. Not. Um, uh, mainly based on the resorts and on Istanbul. Um, and it, on 2019, it had 45 million tourists in one year. 2020, pandemic, and it went down to 15 million. So you can imagine how many hotels were closed, how many companies were um, on the rock bottom, how many guides were out of work and so on. Um, there was a lot of um, hardship in the industry. But people knuckled down and hoped for better times. Um, last year, tourism crept up again and it was at um, 30 million. But the bias has changed. Um, the people ha have decided that they, want, they don't want resort tourism um, so much as a more um, nature-based and um, socially distanced form of tourism. So the things that are popular now are um, the rentals, um, apartment rentals, um, walking holidays, stays in villages, um, all sorts of um, classes and things um, in small in small groups and small communities and so on. Um, so this is the sort of tourism that we're interested in because we deal exclusively in walking routes. And if you look at this map of Turkey, you can see the various routes that are scattered all over here. And here on the, um, on the bottom right-hand side, you will see the Abraham Path, which stretches um, for um, about 150 kilometers inside Turkey um, and goes as far as the border, it meets the border with Syria. Well, of course, it, because of the um, political situation um, in Syria, it's not made any progress on, on, that, on the south side of the border, but the north side of the border, the route was way marked, it's had extensions put on it, the home stay, stay system was very well developed, and um, it was an asset to the area, in fact, it was a great asset to the area. And we're hoping that um, 
now the um, political situation is much better. Now that the pandemic is over, that this will be revived and this route will, will come into use again. Because believe you me, the people in that area, they need it. They need a, an economic shot in the arm to help their area recover. Um, it, it's been um, a center for refu refugees for many people moving through. The economy has locally been very badly hit, um, far more so than the rest of Turkey. And it's the most beautiful area. It really is. And you showed us a picture a little while ago of J Jerusalem. And the first thing I thought when I saw Jerusalem for the first time was, it's just like Shanli Ufa. Now, Ufa is the city on the, at the central point of the Abraham path in Turkey. And it is so much like Jerusalem. The walls are the same period. The stone is that beautiful, warm limestone color. The alleys and the souks and the bazaars are just like those in Urfa. Um, and even the sounds you hear, a lot of Arabic spoken. A lot of people come to the board from Syria to trade tobacco and for um, white goods for for. Uh, this was before the Syrian war. It's a really interactive city with um, very, very, um, very, very positive relations with, with the places further south and with the Arab world in, gen in general. Um, and I, lo I love um, Shanghai and I love Jerusalem. They're both wonderful, wonderful cities. Um, anyway, apart from the Abraham path, we deal with about... Um, nearly 20 other trails in, in Turkey. But the, the first one that we made was the Likin Way, which is on the part that sticks down into the Mediterranean in the, on, the, on the southern coast. Um, so this is the Likin Way. Um, it was opened in 1999. It was Turkey's first walking route, and it stretches from a place called Oulu Denis, which is a very popular holiday resort to Antalya, where she, which is where I live in the, um, in the east. And it mainly, mainly follows the coasts, but it does climb into the mountains in several places. And it celebrates the Lycian civilization, which was around in this area before the Romans came. And even after the Romans came, it continued for quite a while. Um, with emphasis on the most beautiful old graves, um, fortified cities, ruins everywhere. Um, sorry. And this is a, the Licking Way is a way marked signposted footpath um, along, along the coast. It's walked now by, oh, maybe 30,000 people a year, various nationalities. Um, a lot of Turks have now started to walk. Um, Lots of Russians and Ukrainians who get on very well when they're in our back garden. Um, <laughs> and many, many Europeans as well. Very, very few Americans, actually. And this, this is part of the route. You can see here we're marking um, along the route. It's um, easy to follow. And this is a typical grave on the, on the route that you, you can see this sort of monument from the Elykian civilizations all over the place. Now, the Licking Way was built to, as well as to preserve the old roads, to link the villages which didn't have any tourism at that time, and which now have developed their own miniature tourism industry, um, but based on rural accommodation, homestays, small pensions, um, little cafes and um, places to eat. Um, scattered along the route and servicing the, the walkers that come through. Um, and these, these people mainly don't speak any foreign language, they're, they're just Turkish speaking, they, but they make the people who walk through seem, feel very welcome. Um, they have a way of communicating with them without being able to talk, um, to talk a common language. And um, they get on. They get on with their um, their visitors in a really very practical, very sensible way, and make them feel at home, make them feel comfortable, fill them with food, tea, coffee, and and so on. 
and send them on their way in a, in a much more comfortable way than when, the, when they arrived. So, and it has made an economic difference. Um, when we start, opened the Licking Way, it's about a 30 night route. And there was accommodation on seven nights out of the 30 nights. Um, there's now accommodation on 28 nights of the, of the 30 nights. And there are, well, there's at um, 100 pensions that have sprung up along the route and brought social benefits, economic benefits to, um, to the villages along, along, along there. And it's very necessary because this part of Turkey, in fact, all of Turkey is suffering very much from climate change. The summers are getting hotter, the winters are getting shorter, the rain is falling later and later in the autumn, agriculture is badly affected. Um, there is almost no tobacco grown now. Um, it's a main, mainstream crop and on the southern part of Turkey, it's, it's over, it's finished. There's not enough water to produce cotton. Um, and so people's lifestyles have had to change. The, the one thing that has, or the two things that have stayed constant in this area are the olive trees and the beekeeping. So we have honey and we have olives and that, that continues. And in the mountains, we also have the goats. So milk and cheese um, from the, and meat from the goats, olives and honey. We have the basics of a Mediterranean diet, um, which is augmented with you know, the new crops, the new crops like tomatoes, which are grown in greenhouses around the coast. And um, so the, the villagers are able to provide a very nice cuisine. Some of them still make handmade carpets, kilims, or flat weave rugs for, um, for sale to the villagers. And um, in fact, we're ho holding a carpet workshop next month for, um, for a tourism group. Hey, this um, is just fascinating. I'm, I'm really, so, I'm, first of all, I'm not quarteringly hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to hear that you're continuing with programs for people and that, that, that the tourism and the number of people coming has been on the rise uh, since 2021. I'm very, I'm relieved to hear that. I, what I'd like to do is move uh, on to our, our guest from Iraqi Kurdistan. But there's a question here from Sarah Watman, which is asking something that pertains, I think, to the work you're doing specifically in trail development and helping API get to know uh, the Kurdistan regional government and, and its region there. Uh, for long distance trails, and this you could answer this too, Kate, but I'm going to direct it initially to Omer. For long distance trails in these countries, are guides necessary or can they be self guided? Omer, would you recommend that when someone comes to walk in the mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan that they have a guide or that they walk on their own? Yes, from Kurdistan, we still have very a lot of landmines. So between uh, Saddam Hussein and Iran's war in uh, 1988, so still now we have many uh, landmines. So the guide is very, very important for because you cannot find something like a mine dangerous place with a, a GPS or something like this. So for all the... Uh, for the most of the mountains from Kurdistan, you need guide because uh, there's still have, unfortunately, we have a mine on the mm -hmm. mountain somewhere. Yeah. I'm sharing a map of the Kurdistan region now. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see that, Omer, with yeah, this sort of outline of, of the trail that we have uh, been working together with your country people to do. And you are over here, right, in the... Yeah. Eastern. I am from Choman. I'm from Choman right now. Yeah. So you must walk all the time. You must be quite a mountaineer. Yeah, yeah. We are around Choman. It's all covered by uh, mountains. So we have the highest peak of uh, Iraq. It's the Halgur Mountains is very close to Choman. It's just 20 minutes by car. So all right. We have a picture we... of Halgur Mountain. Let's put up that picture of Halgur. And, and you can just describe that for us and some of the other sites. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we are just uh, Choman is under this mountain, so it's very. We can if you open the window, you can see this mountain. 
So it's the highest peak of the Zagros because the start in Zagros is very long mount, a lot of mountains, but the highest one is Halgor Mountain. So from Erbil to this mountain is just uh, two hours and 13 minutes. So after uh, destroy Saddam Hussein, then many foreign people, they came in to visit this mountain because of for a long time, uh, anyone couldn't visit this mountain, but we have still uh, behind this mountain and uh, from the uh, left, uh, there's have some landmine. But uh, for sure, for for this mountain, you need guy to to stay there or hiking or skiing or anything activity from this mountain. There's a regular, there's an annual ski race, isn't there? Also. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a ski race, Iraqi ski race as soon as possible coming. Well, show us something else. What else would you like to tell us here about, uh, about what is available? Okay, Lalish. Yeah, we have a Lalish template. So it's, uh, you know, the Yazidian people, when ISIS came to Iraq, the more 2,500 uh, ISIS women controlling by uh, ISIS fighters. So. After this uh, situation, now many tourists in the world, they just want to meet with this, like um, the religious, they are not Muslim, they are not uh, like a Christian, they are uh, Yazidian. The Yazidian uh, religion is very different with, with Muslim and with, but the uh, Yazidian is uh, like a Kurdish people, but it's a different religion, they are not Muslim. Then uh, there's uh, many caves inside that temple and the historical is very more uh, 4,000 years ago. Then uh, they have many, like when you go to inside the cave, you're always shocking about something there. So yes, and very close to this place, we have a, a Roman home history, like a monastery place from al -Khosh. Uh the, 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 yeah, this one is very, uh, you know, it's, I, I think this, this is the second uh, place after Vatican for uh, Christians, like uh, Charles for Christians. So uh, there is a very old, like a uh, symmetry inside this cave and many caves inside this uh, places. So it's very interesting for some people who is coming to Iraq and they visit uh, this place It's very important places and just from uh, Duhok in yeah. Wow. Imagine trying to build that place, Omar, on the side of the mountain there. What yeah, incredible it's work. It's on the mountain, of course. And uh, we have uh, many other places from Kurdistan. So after uh, destroy Saddam Hussein, we have many hotels from Erbil and from Suleimania, Duhok, and we have a lot of resort places on the mountain and we have a telepreak and we have some place for Seeking and we have a beautiful waterfall as well. So you know, we the important thing we we have to just explain for the world. We have uh, many places for tourists, and the important thing from Kurdistan, the nature is untouched. It's very new, and uh, it's not like uh, uh, people touching like a uh, mountainous or something. So it's very clean and uh, it's untouched. The nice, uh, it's very beautiful uh, nature we have in the mountain. So the most of area from Cruz is a mountain. That's why we have a nice nature here. It, that's what something that Kate said, that people have decided they don't want to be on buses any longer. They want nature-based tourism. It sounds like it, Northern Iraq, the Kurdistan regional government area is the place, is one good place to go for nature. I've seen some of those photographs. Are people, yes, go ahead, Kate. Sure. Just get a comment on that. Um, I mean, I know the Turkish side of the of your area. Um, I know the Zab River very well, and um, Hakkari, and the area of um, Turkey where, where the, it, the population is mainly Kurdish. The mountains there are absolutely stunning. Um, the biodiversity is amazing. It really is absolutely stunningly amazing, especially in spring. It's a wonderful destination if you're a botanist or biologist. 
if you want to see birds in their natural habitat and the big hunting birds, I mean the eagles and kites and raptors of all different sorts, vultures and so on. Um, because it's on the migration path coming up from Africa and where the, where the birds spread out into, into Russia and so on for the summer. Um, and the people are absolutely charming. Um, no, and um, they lead a very simple simple life um, where they they were very, very restricted by the various wars that have gone in that, on that area. Um, and they've lived a very, very hard life and suffered greatly. But um, they still keep cheerful. They keep their customs and they, um, they appreciate their surroundings. Well, there you go. There's a great promotion for you, Omer. And you're... Yeah, th thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, 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 she helped me to more about Kurdish people. For sure, you know, before yeah. we wasn't have a, like we we had we wasn't have a, like internet, and we have not any uh, relation with the European country and the American country. So, and yeah, it, Kurdish people is very friendly. They like a friendly and hospitality because you know when the foreign people is coming to Kurdistan. So still now we, we didn't sell some uh, national peoples and na national people. So we want everyone in the world coming to Kurdistan. We want to meet with the new people from because we now we have, in the world have many countries in the world, but a lot of people in the world, they didn't know anything about uh, Kurdistan or for example, for, about Kurd. Then we are Kurd and we're speaking Kurdish. Our culture is different. We are... Yes, we are a Muslim and we have a Christian people, or all Kurdish people, but they are Christian. But uh, our traditional, our food, everything is different. So, uh, yeah, Kurdish people is very happy when see uh, some foreign people when they coming to Kurdistan, because and a lot of people want to travel for for other country in the world because it's very new airport from Kurdistan and passport and internet. So. Now we can we can see the world, yeah, because before we wasn't have something to <laughs> to introduce it with the other country in the world. Do you see more people coming there now as the pandemic seems to be abating, or is it too early to tell, Omer? Yeah, for sure, we see uh, many people in the world. They just looking to coming to Kurdistan. Then, uh, especially after Iraq decision to more 32 countries in the world, they can't fly to Baghdad without visa. So it's very important and help it for tourists. Then uh, we're just waiting to know more people now about Kurdistan and Iraq. So it's very, very important. And Iran path make like, they coming for Kurdistan to make some plan for Kurdistan. Then we are very happy to welcome the uh, Iran path to Kurdistan. It's very, very important for, for future tourism in Kurdistan. Working together with you is very important for us because yeah. it won't happen. It's it's yeah. your it's your trail. It's going to be yours. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So we're coming up. I can't believe we're coming up toward the end of the hour, and I've got other questions for you. Um, I wanted to know what kind of support you could really use, all of you, um, to get the word out. Where you have your governments been helpful? during this time of stress um, and you know what do you need the most um, if i may start um, governments have not really been the, the best of help as of recent uh, oh, since covid started uh, from our experience uh, both the palestinian government and since the israeli government which i mean does come into play since they control the borders uh, this is a, uh, for both governments, they have tried as much as possible not to involve themselves at this, as it would be very costly for them to do so. So they were on the side of, you know, spend as much as, as less as possible uh, in the sector to, to keep it maybe enough afloat in some areas and not even anything in others. So for us, the best thing that can happen is just talk about our uh, tourism products more, our, about our services more. Because the only thing that can actually help us is if we are able to, uh, at the end of the day, sell more of our highly, uh, of our highly valuable products that we have worked on uh, so hard. So, I mean, that would be the best thing. We, uh, 
in Palestine, there's a thing where a lot of people rely on NGOs and international funding, but the really the big solution is uh, organic development for the private sector uh, in all areas, both cultural and uh, um, historical and all of that together. Kate, what about what about in your situation? Uh, in our situation, um, the governments handled the pandemic fairly well, but on the other hand, um, obviously there was a huge crash in tourism, which is a very important part of the Turkish economy. It's um, The restrictions have been lifted as quickly as possible and people are returning now. Um, the support that we would really like is to for people to change their view of Turkey because it's viewed as a mass tourism destination um, you know with hotels sun sea sand on the Mediterranean and so on and so on and the interior of the country um, is very very different um, it's such an ancient country it's just being lived in by so occupied by so many civilizations and just by traveling through the interior um, and especially by ap appreciating the mountains and the small villages in the mountains, the life that goes on there now, um, then it gives you a totally different perspective on, on the culture, the, the society and so on. Um, very, very different from Istanbul or even Antalya city centre. Um, I have a house in a village um, which is dates back, it's a 4,000 year old village. And the ruin, the houses are built of the stones that the that people used 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and so on. A Roman emperor stayed in our village. Um, it has inscriptions recording him where he was. It has lists of the gods of the, of the Romans built into the wall of the mosque. Um, you know, they reused the stone, they couldn't read it, they put it up sideways of um, placing it vertically, and it lists Roman gods. Um, yeah, it's just a superb little place to, to, to stay, to experience life with, with local people. Um, and it's dying because people are um, moving to the cities and um, uh, they are unable to, to um, practice the agricultural practice because um, of, the, of climate change affecting people. But when visitors do come, they are really welcoming. Um, they love showing people around um, and um, feeding them the local food and, um, and showing them the, the ruins, the, um, the citadel, because we have a little citadel of our own, um, and the ruins, the, the tombs in the fields, and so on. Um, and I wish people, could, more people, could see this aspect of Turkey mm -hmm. rather than the city centres and the commercial hotels along the beaches. Well, we do have one of our audience members, Yvette Ogunchil, and I'm not sure if Yvette, if, Yvette, if I pronounced your name correctly, but forgive me if I haven't. Who is going to be coming to Shanlurfa uh, shortly mm -hmm. for a trek? So. Oh, great. Good. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And she is a solo female traveler, uh, owner of the Petam yeah. Travels Company. So she's, uh, you're not the only uh, solo female tra traveler in Turkey. And, and uh, <laughs> we hope that this conditions remain wonderful. Omer, I'm going to give you the last, the last word about the kind of support you need. And um, what would you like to see coming? Actually, my you know I have a message for all the the social media media in the world. Every you know the most of social media focusing only on the about the war and you know the war is not important for any country in the world. They you know they destroy like a, the tourism uh, business in the world. So the tourism business for the world is very important for every country in the world. But still now the most of social media when they they see the bad thing. They they make a, like a big program, big TV, big things for 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 the bad things. But we know we have a very beautiful thing in the world. So this is very important 
the other social media in the world are focusing about. Uh, I'm not just talking only for Kurdistan, but for Kurdistan is more important because you know we have many things happened in the last two years ago, and uh, Kurdistan couldn't support in anything for tourism because we also have other problems with the ISIS and with the Buddha, with the Iraq or something else, with the, some borders, with the, you know, but um, we try, you know, uh, as, a, as our company, we try to advertising a lot for Kurdistan. We have a historical place, many places for visit. Yeah, and uh, thanks so much for Ibrahim Pa to working about the Kurdistan tourism for future. We have a huge respect for, for this. Thank you. I want you to know that all of the contact information we have for you, we are putting into the chat for our viewers so that they can reach out to you and learn more about your projects and your products and what you're doing. I want to thank all of you, Dimitri Kashram of Aeolus Tours, Kate Clough from Culture Roots Society, and Omar Chomani of VI Kurdistan for being with us here today, for illuminating us and our audiences on your work, inspiring us to take the, te take the next step and, and travel and be there, inshallah, if it's possible. I also like to say to our audience that we are a not-for-profit Abraham Path Initiative is grateful to all of you who are watching, who are donors, and we welcome the support of all of you so that we can continue in our way to support our, our guests through online programming and also uh, work on the ground to catalyze walking trails and the great economic benefits for, for this kind of travel that all of you have shared with us. We'll leave you today with more photographs from the Kurdistan region of Iraq. These are the slides that Omar has shared with us. So if you'd like to see more of those beautiful images from Kurdistan, just stay here. And we look forward to seeing you next month for another episode of Meet Us on the Abraham Path. Thanks all. Omar, I wanted you to ask me had I been to Iraq. So yes, I, I was in Iraq several decades ago to meet my grandmother, who at the time was living in a section of Baghdad. She was a widow, and both her sons had moved out of the country to get their education abroad. She spoke only Arabic, and we had very little we could say to each other with words, but as Kate described, there was a way we could communicate with food, with smiles, with gestures, with holding hands. That allowed me to experience a deep part of my soul that is indeed from the land of Iraq. And that's what I wanted to share with you. And I can't wait to come to Kurdistan and feel that place. Very welcome. built around the same time as the St. George's Monastery in the Wadi Celts in Palestine. Mm -hmm.